Um, we're going to keep going. We actually have a bit of a, a panel discussion um, to kind of close out this session. The panel is actually going to be uh, headed up by Russell Telford of um, AG Coombs. And I'm going to leave it to Russell to um, introduce the rest of his panelists. But when we asked Russell about his experience of COVID, he described it as the most amazing social experiment on steroids. And the thing that has really struck him is about how it had such a positive impact on the cross functional collaboration within teams uh, within AG Coombs. And um, I think that's something that a lot of organizations have experienced is that in some ways, you know, the, that, you know, this uh, approach of especially video conferencing as a way of connecting has taken away the classic geographical barriers of either being in different buildings, different cities, or even just being on different floors. Um, anyway, without further ado, I will open up to Russell, who's going to be having a panel discussion on the developer's perspective on innovation. Over to you, Russell. Thanks, Simon. Um, great to be with you and uh, thanks for that warm introduction. Um, very uh, importantly, um, we've had a great conference so far and it is my pleasure to really try and give a bit of a development developer's perspective on innovation to welcome our two panelists. Um, first of all, um, both of them don't really need a lot of introduction in the industry because they've been um, around the traps um, in various forms for a long time, but they also have some really um, uh, heavy roles in terms of our, our sector. So first of all, welcome Chris from CBUS. Um, great to have you with us, Chris. And also just while I'm welcoming you, uh, mate, I was just going to do a little bit of quick Q&A um, just to talk to you about your role, um, but also just want to acknowledge the support of CBUS to the forum um, for the last couple of days. So Chris, would you just like to talk a little bit about your functional role at CBUS and, and a little bit of your history? Sure, Russell, thanks. Um, well, thank you for having me in the first instance. My role is, so I've been at CBUS property now for about almost 20 years, 20 fun-filled years. Before that, I had 10 years at Fletcher Construction. Uh, so I think I've got a good uh, awareness of both the construction uh, industry and the development industry. But So my role as, as COO now at CBUS property is to look after the development and asset management components of the business. And we've got, um, you know, a really successful business and I'm proud to have been part of the start of that, uh, that, that organisation and, and how successful it's been. And we've got a great portfolio of, of commercial assets and residential assets that, uh, that uh, present in Melbourne, Sydney and, and Brisbane with a little development about to start in Adelaide and uh, something that we've done a while ago in Perth. So... Look, I'll, to be involved in a, an organisation like CBUS Property, which is only about 40 people strong, and what we've been able to deliver is, has been fantastic, and I'm really proud to have been part of that, and that's really been helped with the with the support of CBUS. So, um, you know, they've given us a lot of room and and um, ability to to enter into those markets and to to take their values and translate it into being what we love being being representative of, of the industry and we've kicked some in summary and, and I guess from a person who follows the industry closely and active in the industry just want to really acknowledge the great work CBUS has done and um, we all follow it with great interest so great to have you along today mate. Um, Murray Coleman, uh, oh, oh I am actually, I've got to add that bit on there Murray, um, I won't mention Coleman. Um, obviously, um, we talk a little bit about your new role recently, but pre uh, Macquarie, um, you obviously had a, an amazing career within Lend Lease, um, 30 plus years going from project engineer uh, all the way in Australia, um, pieces overseas in terms of Asia, Europe, other, other places. And then you've, um, well, I was going to say gone to the dark side, but you're already on the dark side. You've gone jumped to the development side. As the last sort of phase of your career, can you just talk through a bit about your current role, a little bit about your history? Aaron? Yeah, thanks for telling me. Let me know that was the last phase of my career, Russell. That's good. <laughs> um, no, <laughs> look, uh, thanks very much for inviting me uh, to join this panel. Uh, it's been very interesting. Uh, as you said, I spent uh, thirty years with Lend Lease, um, and you know, from uh, from starting up, as you say, as a site engineer, through to running the Australian business, uh, to running the UK business. Uh, Asia PAC, uh, running the the um, project management, design and construction business globally, being involved in the acquisition of 
uh, you know, Borderstone Abbey Group, some of which turned out okay, some of which obviously didn't turn out okay from what you've seen recently. Um, but uh, but more recently, um, I, I joined Macquarie Capital. Had a fantastic time, actually. I joined here primarily to initially look at the Martin Place, Metro Martin Place USP, um, and we closed that uh, just on two years ago now, actually. And uh, I now... I'll now look at a whole variety of things from having an oversight on that project, which is about a $3 billion development, the station and the two towers above. I do a lot of work with Snowy 2.0 or Snowy Hydro on Snowy 2.0 and, and also um, Inland Rail PPP. We're gearing a development uh, over in on the Air Peninsula and, uh, and uh, most recently, um, we're uh, in, in there pitching hard for the Western Harbour Tunnel development partner role. So we do a, a wide variety of things. Um, there's always something to do at Macquarie Capital, trust me. No, and I, and I guess there's, uh, you know, both you and Chris uh, are in tremendous positions where you're levering a raft of experience into some um, different challenges. And I guess yeah. that's what we're going to focus a little bit on Today, we've got, uh, I suppose, a touch of the COVID-19 risk and opportunity overlay on some of our discussion, but ultimately, um, the Construction Innovation Forum, this is our 11th forum, um, really does aim to promote the adoption of technology to enhance the way construction industry operates. Um, we yep. really look at the practical elements of how technology and process and people come together to work in an integrated way. And I guess, ultimately, we've seen um, lots of examples already in the last uh, day and a half or so of the forum both in Australia and also with our overseas presenters in the previous session. Um, we've also heard about, I suppose, that little bit of risk and opportunity COVID overlay that's coming. So people are already talking, what does it all mean post-COVID-19? I'm not sure we know when or what post-COVID-19 uh, post is going to eventuate. Um, but I'll, honestly, within all the, with all the challenges of business at the moment, is, is this really leading to some, some fundamental changes in the way we work? We've heard about things like industrialised construction and looking at the whole integration of supply chain. Obviously, a lot of the technology we focus this form around, um, it has its application. We've really adopted strongly on the platforms of technology under almost under being forced in the in the last uh, six months or so. So just from that um, sort of outset, from uh, putting your own personal sort of experience in this and also looking through a little bit of developer's perspective, but both of you have got excellent um, history and background in building. Um, the beginning of, of where we are in terms of innovation and what does innovation mean to you? What do you see as um, as the things that we're doing and that are innovative? Where do you see the barriers, the gaps? How are you feeling about your own personal perspective, our industry in Australia particularly, and obviously some overseas benchmarking experiences? What do you really see as your concept of innovation and the way that way, way we look at things? So I might get you to kick off first, Murray, and I'll shut up with you. Yeah, Okay. Yeah. Look. No, uh, no worries. The uh, look innovation. I, I guess. Look. There's a lot of different definitions, and I've had things fed up to sped up to me over the years. But for me, it. it oh, I always associated, or it conjures up to me the concept of a breakthrough, something that's something where uh, you know there's a newly conceived way of doing something or achieving something or using something. And the best example I, I always use is uh, Dick. Fosbury with the Fosbury flop, you know, when he turned up at the 1968 Olympics and he jumped uh, head over the bar backwards and people said, what the hell is all this? But it was just, it changed everything forever. And that's, you know, in terms of high jump. And, that, and that's what innovation does. It, it, it changes things forever. Um, so that's the kind of real breakthrough stuff. I mean, a lot of people call a variety of things innovation. For me, you know, it really needs that breakthrough. Otherwise, it's just you know, good old-fashioned inventiveness and, and you know, as I say, necessity is mother invention. We all need to do that. But the real breakthrough stuff is is innovation. And so how do I think we're, we're going with that in the construction industry? I think there's kind of two ways to look at it, to be honest. So I, I had a, a bit of a think about this and I can list off a bunch of things that I think have happened, you know, in the time I've been in the industry, which is kind of, you know, close to 40 years now, uh, and, and things... Um, you know, things in particularly materials technology, I guess, you know, there's been some extraordinary breakthroughs in, in different types of materials. There's, 
there's been um, a lot on the ICT side, and I know you've been speaking a lot about about BIM and the developments of BIM, uh, but, you know, the cloud spot modelling. Uh, you know, the, I've recently been doing a lot of work or a bit of work with Snowy 2.0 team, looking at reaching out in terms of what technology we might be able to implement on that project, and we've been dealing with the Innovation Lab and the guys who head up innovation for Oracle uh, in, in construction engineering. And, and you know, because they have some of the key products we all use, Aconex, P6, Primavera, and others, and they bundle these things together and use other, other uh, pieces of software to give you some quite astounding results. It's all pretty much in its infancy, but some really, really interesting stuff. Um, and, and so I look at all that and I think, you know, the, the DFMA, the modern methods of construction, the three, you know, the 3D additive manufacturing, we see a little bit of that in Australia, not a lot, to be honest, but a little bit. Um, but then I, I look at all that, but then if I stand back and I think, you know what, the, um, what, what, what are we still using for our, uh, to, to build our lift cores? In, in high-rise buildings in Australia, we're using a version of a jump form, which is a version of a climb form, and I can remember seeing my first one of those nearly 40 years ago on 222 Exhibition Street when Lewis Construction was actually around. I mean, that hasn't really changed much, that stuff. Um, and, you know, some of the core ways that we construct in Australia and, and, and look at the productivity in Australia and in, in, in more broadly on, on building sites, I think that, you know, I, I don't feel there's been a lot change really. So, so I think there are some elements that have been very innovative and we've seen some change, but there are some that I think are very disappointing and, and we still do things the same way and, and, and that goes even through to the way that we procure and, uh, you know, the types of contracting arrangements, the, the master servant, the, the, you know, the whole shebang. Um, every now and again, you get a little bit of a breakout wanting to head a different way, but, but it hasn't fundamentally changed and, and you know, many say that, this, this, is our, this is our time for opportunity. And I, I think people need to think long and hard about that. Yeah, that's a, a really good summary, Murray. And I guess in a lot of ways, um, obviously we're a little bit heavily dominated with MEP and, and others within this forum. So, you know, yep. the things that happen outside of sometimes the core construction piece in the data centres, in the pharmaceutical areas, in the, in the technical industrial area that, and you've obviously got a little bit of, Tying with some of that infrastructure work. So yep. I really, really uh, acknowledge those comments. And perhaps while we're just on a little bit of a roll, I might circle back on that in a minute. But throw to you, Chris, a little bit, uh, just sort of to repeat the question, just from a personal perspective um, in terms of innovation and, and how you see things. Sure. I'll start out by saying I don't, I don't actually like the term innovation. I think it's, it's just getting played too much. For me, I, I prefer the term curiosity. I, I prefer that people are curious and to identify, actually, you know, embed themselves in process, ask the question, why are we doing something or how can we do something better? Actually, through um, not just following the standard process that we seem to, you know, I go to sit at many PCGs or sit around many meetings like the rest of us do, and you just feel like there's just a, a level of going through the motions without anyone understanding what the objective is that we're trying to set out and then how to actually deliver on that objective or to deliver something even better. Um, you know, uh, like Murray mentioned, that the procurement, for me, for me, for starters, I don't see enough innovation. I don't see that we've changed enough. I see, I get frustrated a lot by seeing the way we deliver stuff, the, the, the inefficiencies that we go through a design process, we get a QS estimate and it's it's, um, you know, it's at a number, then the tender's too high, then we've got to go back and we've got to rationalise it, then we've got to go through planning and then we're, we're having conversations with planners and they're not honest conversations and then we don't get the approval that we want and then we've overpaid for the site and then we're going back and around the, the um, you know, the process again and by that stage everyone's lost their love for the, you know, the consultants have fed up, they've spent all their money. So there's just some basic stuff that I just don't think that we're really... Um, asking ourselves, how do we actually deliver a better outcome? What is the problem we're trying to solve? How do we fix that problem better? How do we collaborate to, um, one, identify and two, get a better outcome? So, yeah, we, we're building that's building ma massive buildings in the same way we've done before. Um, those buildings generally are becoming more complicated and I don't know that we're necessarily finding better ways of 
of addressing the risks and the complications. Yeah, we've got more screens on the sides of buildings and that's fantastic because theoretically we've got less stuff that's going to fall, fall outside. But the reality is, you know, I'm still getting reports of how much stuff falls out the sides of the building still even with the screens up. So um, I think it's, it, for me, it's frustrating, but I, I think what, um, what excites me about the about it is that frustration for me is an identification of how much opportunity there is to improve. And by having more of these conversations and trying to engage with more people and recognising that perhaps now we're right in the sweet spot of maybe getting some, some genuine change out of the industry in that hopefully we're not all so manically busy doing the same thing that we've done before, that we can stand back. Hopefully, if there is some opportunity to put some R&D have better conversations about, okay, how do we procure better? How do we engage better with our subcontractors or our head contractors? How do we engage better with our planners? Um, we can have those conversations to get a better, be more informed position or get better contracting terms or whatever it is so that when we get busy again, we're actually got a better opportunity to, to improve on what, we've, uh, what we perhaps haven't had the opportunity to do in the past because we've just been all so busy. I think the other thing that just goes with that, Chris, and I know Murray just mentioned that um, in, in one of his comments, a little bit about the delivery model, the risk allocation, the collaboration, the ability to integrate, take a, an overall best of project view, because naturally we are set up as stakeholders to probably be automatically in conflict with each other in some, in some ways just by the contractual um, model or the delivery model. Is there anything innovative that you're seeing from um, other, other yourselves or, or other um, sectors or, or perhaps in, in some di different things of other countries about that uh, opportunity to maybe look at different project delivery models. I'll maybe get you to comment on that first, Murray, and jump back to you, Chris. Oh, look, I, I, to be honest with you, you know, we, we, we've seen all of the, the partnership and alliance models mm. and, and, you know, they, they, they seem to come and go in terms of favour and vogue. I think the thing, I think what we're starting to see now on the, the bigger scale of things, um, what we're seeing uh, certainly in New South Wales, and I suspect more and more so in Victoria going forward, is we're going to see the, the risk allocation shift again. We're going to see the risk come off uh, for some of the larger contractors, given the experience over the last few years. Uh, you know, the profitless infrastructure boom, as they call it. Um, and, and I think you're going to see more kind of target price, incentivised DNC contracts, which are going to require a different approach from the client. But, but they aren't, that's not especially fundamental. We've done all that before. And that really goes from a, you know, a, a supply and demand issue. And, and as the pendulum swings, and we've all seen it, you know, when, when there's tons of work around and no one wants to take the risk, then it kind of pendulum swings one way. And when there's not so much and 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 the contractors are cutting each other's throats and and slashing their margins, it goes the other way. So, um, but the, the one thing I, I think we we found a, a, a great deal of uh, success with is the ECI process, and and I think uh, contractors typically uh, embrace that. Certainly, in my experience, that. Um, that you can have a fairly a fairly low cost credentials uh, approach to then select a contractor that that you feel might be right for the project against a whole set bunch of criteria. And I know when we did it, did this for the Martin Place uh, USP, you know we had the four primary uh, you know commercial uh, contractors around. So we had Multiplex, John Holland. CPB and lend lease, and uh, we shortlisted it to three. We ran a competition. We selected one, um, but it didn't cost anyone a fortune to do it. And, uh, and you know, the worst thing is when people spend a lot of money on these bids and, and miss out. And of course, there's been a swing on the infrastructure side back over the last couple of years with that as well, with the payment of stipends. And 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 you know, these stipends are not. Are not small. I mean, the NEL, the North East Link type in, I think, is eighty-one million dollars. Yeah. So you know, these 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 are outrageous. I mean, that's a depending on your numbers, a thirteen or sixteen billion dollar project. But but you know, even on the likes of inland rail, they're very extensive and very expensive stipends. So I, I don't I don't haven't seen any kind of uh, any uh, you know silver bullet 
the, the one, there are a couple of models floating around that I'm very interested in. And, and um, uh, if you've ever come across the, the PT Blink model, which is a, it's a kind of variation of, of DFMA, but it really uh, starts to connect with the manufacturing base so that various elements of a project can be manufactured on a widespread basis. And the builder becomes more of a, an integrator facilitator. It's a very different model. That's the kind of thing that's going to take, you know, a, a bit of courage for um, for a developer to get behind and have a crack at. But it, it promises it to be a very different model. And if you could kind of get that, start to get some traction, I think you would start to see some difference. That's the most different thing I've seen for a while that I think that shows a lot of promise. No, thanks, Murray. It's really um, really good summary. Chris, um, in terms of project delivery, I mean, there's a sense that uh, CBUS property probably has a, a bit of a cookie cutter approach sometimes to get the outcomes in the way it works. Is there anything there that you're at attached to or seeing that we could be doing a little bit better in terms of um, delivery models? Uh, predominantly, we've used the DNC approach, um, you know, and that's got some good attributes and bad ones. I've used DCI before and haven't enjoyed that process. And um, I, I think a lot of these issues, whether it's DNC or ECI, a lot of it a lot of it relates to the time availability. I think what where we've been very fortunate in the past is we've been great at buying a site, doing a quick bit of planning, documentation, getting a pre-commitment, and then we've got to start the next day. And I think we've got to be honest with ourselves and say that's not the best way to deliver the right level mm -hmm. of documentation to get the right outcomes. And I think you know, we, we need two two elements, I think, to get better outcomes and um, quite easily that I get overlooked we or too hard to deliver on. We need the right people in the room. I think we keep on constantly coming up with issues and we come up with different issues um, and, you know, they tend to, it doesn't take much for them to blow up in someone's face quite quickly, whether it's the builder or the consultant or the, the developer or whoever it is. Quite commonly I'm saying that we don't have the right people at the table asking the right questions to to um, to flag those sorts of issues when we've got an opportunity to get on top of them. And I think if we could do that better, we can sort of address many issues that we can't necessarily uh, address in a process. But time, we've just got to, we've got, we've got to find ourselves a little bit more time in the process. And perhaps this is what I assume in Europe happens a little bit better, where the architect is given a little bit more credit, is spending a lot more fees perhaps on the architect rather than we, we might spend 3% here. There that might be you know a six percent or so. The quality of documentation, the quality of the research that goes into the the documentation before it's actually produced, the the theoretical collaboration or integration between the services and the like. And I, I think we've got to stop running and actually take a breath, pause a bit more frequently, ask some better questions, revisit things. Okay, are we on track with planning? Are we on track with um, costs and then go again rather than just skipping through. I think for me, you know, I, I summarise, I, I would suspect a lot of our issues translate to that, jumping on with a builder, um, perhaps not giving them the right documentation, not establishing for a fair tender process. So, you know, where we find ourselves with builders, and let's be honest, we don't have many tier ones, but if we're not feeding them all the right information, someone's going to take a more aggressive position on something because the information's not there. And so they're going to bite them on the bum or, or bite us. Um, either way, it doesn't translate to a, a good outcome. I'd like nothing more than the builder to walk up to the project, think they're going to make 5% and walk out the back of it on time, mm -hmm. 5%, and everyone's happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if, I, if I can just add to that, uh, Russell, I mean, I, 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 I spent no. seven years in London over a couple of different stints over about 10 years. And the one thing I would say is that the model there is very different. The model there has what we know as the project management element. So the project management that works for lend lease and to some extent some of the other, you know, the multiplexes, the wood, et cetera, that doesn't exist in the contractors over there. That exists in the developers over there. So the developers do all that, what they call project development management, and the contractors don't do that at all. They're just more about construction methodology, pricing and execution. They don't have that. They have very little design management and they certainly don't have that really front-end creative design management. And mm -hmm. So I think you just, you'd want to think, you'd want to really think carefully before 
sliding to that kind of model would be my view. Yeah, well, the industry's got to be able to go with the, and have the skills and resources to respond. And I think that's a little bit of a challenge as an industry. Your high jumping example, Murray, is exactly where innovation is. And it's hard to get someone to actually have enough courage to jump over backwards, you know. So yeah. I think well, there's an element well, of that with it. <laughs> so. I, I think that's right. And for me, we, we, we don't want to dumb down the construction industry. We want to push it the other way, right? So mm. we, 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 want to, we want our construction organisations, our consultant PMs, our, our lead specialist contractors, we want them all you know, going the other way. We, we want to them increasing their skill and capability, not, not dumbing themselves down. Yeah. Can I just maybe circle back to a little bit of the current? So obviously a bit of pre-COVID, so the Australian government determined March 1st was COVID day. Um, that's where, where things like JobKeeper and other things were born. So pretty much pre that, if you just look at the Australian property industry, we're, we're dealing with some pretty interesting issues. And a lot of them were, were quality aspects. I guess we had the fungal cladding, the non-conforming and non-complying product type issues. We also had quite a a bit of opal towers. We had some personal, you know, sort of health issues as well. Um, different states, jurisdictions sort of looking at change out of the Shergold Weir report. And then I guess you fast forward that over the last six months and all of a sudden we've got this COVID-19 risk and opportunity overlay with all of that. Those things haven't really gone away. Um, they're, they're all there. Just, I suppose, potentially, you know, just trying to look ahead, is, is this a real, you know, potentially one of the greatest periods of disruption that our industry's faced and is this can this be harnessed to be a bit more of a generational opportunity to do things differently or is it is it going to be stuck in the way we do things is there actually lasting reform um available at, at this stage um we might just get you to talk a bit about that one chris first and then jump back to you murray yeah where to start <laughs> to, to answer that question um look covid in terms of conforming materials or reform and the like, I, I'm not sure that anything that's necessarily come as a result of COVID is going to change out. I think we're constantly going to have composite cladding type issues. You know, we've had asbestos in the past. We've got an industry that's trying to be, you know, I'll use the word that I don't like using, innovative, and try and cut, use different materials and perhaps we're too progressive in, in implementing those before the science has got a, an opportunity to catch up. All those health ramifications have had the opportunity to get... Um, get drawn out. So, you know, we, we, we look at in the medical field, I guess there's a much more rigorous level of testing before any any new medicines are able to be uh, dispersed. But maybe in construction, we take a bit of a different view and some of those risks are not necessarily as visible at the start and it takes generations to perhaps see the health issues that are associated with it. I'm not sure that, that that's going to change. I think we've got a lot of... You know, Got a lot of work to do to get past the composite cladding, for instance. Um, there is some great stuff, perhaps, or great attention being shown on get, in, ensuring better quality outcomes. Um, and I think, for me, a lot of the quality issues are coming back to a, an industry being stretched and perhaps um, not focusing enough, not having the right level of supervision or attention or, or the like. And again, I'll go back to time. But in terms of in terms of COVID, it's a it's a really interesting issue about where it's going to go, and it's a for me it's you know a lot of curiosity about how to deal with it and how to um, how to how to implement that or how to take stock of it when we're about to undertake a number of new developments and do we sit back and say we we've got a view that the world's going to return to normal post vaccine um, or do we have to accept that things are different and um, I do subscribe to things being different. I do sub subscribe to a view about fewer people coming into the city. I don't know if it's 5% or 10% or 20% less, but I do have a, a thought that there are a lot of people that commute a long way or actually don't necessarily care about advancing themselves in work and being present in front of their bosses or whatever, or they're doing a job that doesn't require a lot of, um, there's my lights, um, a, a, lot of, um, a lot of need for collaboration. And I think those people will be happy to, to a degree to continue to work at home. So from an office delivery perspective, for instance, we've got, we're confronted with a really big challenge and it's exciting. And, um, you know, we've taken some views internally about how to deal with this. This has come at a perfect time for us because we've been observing the quality issue and the DNC model and trying to take a view on how do we improve on that. Now we're putting out a mindset in the frame that we need to be more cognizant and, you know, 
open up the aperture of awareness of what's going on around us, bringing COVID in on that, seeing that we don't have, you know, if we're in a market that we're, we're relying on tenant pre-commitments before we can get projects effectively up and running, we've either got to not do that, take a different view about financing developments, We've got to accept that tenants perhaps are going to be smaller when they come to market, when they do come to market, because a lot of them um, have got, you know, have paralysed a little bit of how to deal with what's going on. Um, and they're all looking for more flexibility. So we've just got uh, an accumulation of issues that are really just come together. And I, I think uh, we're trying to formulate views of how, how to respond to it. And I think we're hopefully we've got some of the answers, how they translate. We've got a test, and so we've got to be experimental, um, whether it's classified as innovation, but we do have to transition along a way that observes that our tenants are, you know, what enables these projects to get delivered to enable the construction industry to be participants in all of that. And so we need to start um, solving some of those issues. Yeah. Murray, the quality issues and things... How do, you, how do you sort of see that of recent times? You've been around the block a few times. Yeah, well, look, when I was at Lindley's, I was very heavily involved in our in our uh, investigations into all the uh, aluminium composite panel in particular, uh, hmm. use of that material, and we we went back over 25 years to look at, at the involvement and use of that uh you know, all around the world, actually. It was quite an extensive exercise. And, and uh, I'm not sure COVID has done anything uh, for or against that, probably what it's done is it's slowed everything down a little bit in terms of progress here a little bit and probably given people a little bit more time uh, to, to, to take stock and have a think. I mean, different states have dealt with this quite differently. Um, some, I think, you know, uh, everything I've seen tells me that what's happened down in Victoria probably leads the pack. Um, they're, they're now approaching... Uh, some different ways of looking at this up here in New South Wales now with uh, uh, with the new New South Wales Building Commissioner, who's well, not so new anymore. He's been there for a year or so. Um, but um, I, I think, uh, you know, I think inevitably there will be uh, quality issues. Hopefully this has sharpens every, sharpened everyone's focus. It's going to be very interesting to see where the Grenfell inquiry really ends up uh, that's been running now for some time over in the UK, and, and where they end up in terms of uh, recommendations, uh, in terms of in terms of um, actions going forward. But um, but I think you know as long as our supply chain uh, you know imports so much kit from from uh, electrical cable through to you know uh, through to uh, aluminium aluminium panel, whether it's composite panel, whether it's fire rated, whether it's not fire rated, et cetera, et cetera, or we're always going to have a level of exposure. So I think there are there are some good thoughts and thinking that's going on, uh, you know, uh, from the building commissioner up here in New South Wales about how they might be approaching a more systemic manner. Um, so I, I would kind of watch that space for the next few months. Yeah. It, 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 in terms in terms of um, in terms of uh, the market going forward and what does is there a post-COVID? I mean, it's all very hard to tell, and I think the jury is completely out. Every person I speak to, well, not every, but 95% of them say to me, well, you know what, this this kind of hybrid two or three days at, at working from home and two or three days in the office works pretty well, and, and if anything, there are, you know, people do more at home and less in the office, and, and uh so I think for the foreseeable future, at least until there's widespread vaccination, I think that's the new normal. Um, whether that changes after that, I just don't know. And I, you know, I think well, they say it takes eight weeks to develop a, a new habit. Yeah. Well, guess what? We've had six months of it, and um, and a lot of people have got a lot of new habits. And and I, I think um, I think it's a difficult narrative for 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 organisations, you know, for the large REITs, for the Lend leases of the world that talk about having a hundred and twenty billion dollar pipeline, uh, but you know, one hundred and twenty billion dollar pipeline pre-COVID to a hundred and twenty billion dollar pipeline emerging out of COVID, made up of commercial, retail, which is already in trouble, and residential, which on the apartment side is not in great shape. Um, build to rent perhaps might save some of that in Australia, but I think that's a difficult narrative now, and and. Um, 
you know, what will the effect of COVID be on, on occupancy and use of space? I mean, I, I think I think all the developers I talk to want to, want to impress the, that there's a collective wisdom that uh, less people will be going into the office, but they will need more space, so it nets itself out. Well, that's a kind of convenient equation, in my view. Um, I'm not so sure that's right. Yeah, and I think we've got a lot to work through and some yeah. of the good habits people have developed have gone hand in hand with some bad habits that have developed as well. So it's yeah. a really interesting mix. And I guess just looking at the industry, you've got the uncertainty and Chris touched on a little bit with what, what does your anchor tenant look like for your next development? Um, all, the, yeah. all the way through to um, the government stimulus package that's obviously the federal government announced its stimulus package um, in terms of some of the medium longer term pipeline work and obviously with various state governments getting there budgets together with with a spend uh, our way out of this approach is it's a really interesting time for the industry there is sort of a bit of a work hole potentially created followed by um what could be another boom so and, and that you know and, and you say the anchor tenant i mean that you know there's some, just some uh, uh, most peculiar messaging in the market you know there's the been all the talk and the fanfare about the atlassian largest hybrid building up at the at the western gateway precinct up near central in sydney and that was all announced with a great fanfare. And then a few weeks later, I think Mike Kenan Brooks or or uh, Scott Farquhar came out and said, you know, at Atlassian, in three years' time, you can work wherever you want to work for. Now, yeah. if you're going to be the – and, of course, Atlassian aren't the developer on that building. They're just the head tenant. So so if you're, if you're going to be the owner of that building, you know, I guess you scratch your head a bit and say, how does all that work? Um, yeah. And they're not on their own with those messages. I think Facebook – came out and said the same thing at the same time taking a huge amount of space um, I think it was above uh, above uh, um, Penn Station in New York City so so it's a real mix I think there's a lot of optionality um, happening with organizations really kind of covering their bets because there's a there is a kind of ongoing level of uncertainty yeah absolutely. Um, I guess we've touched on quite a few things. Can I just circle back to a bit of risk allocation? Um, I'm looking at both of you as, as had, you know, experience on both sides, I guess, coming from that building construction background. Do you think the development community generally understand what they pay for in terms of risk allocation? Um, does that really flow through um, into the supply chain like they've understood? And I, you know, I guess in a lot of, and I said a lot of the audience are, you know, MEP based and things where we look at maybe the cost of how things work with the allocation of risk and also the, the stuff around factor that Chris was talking about in terms of skipping over in time. Do you, do you think the community in development actually understand what they pay for or do they pay for it? Is there a, is, 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 are they getting, are they getting value for money in terms of that risk allocation model generally? Oh, look. It's a tough one. I, I think what the generally what the problem, I think, where it originates is that the, the construction industry is too competitive. And in a way, there's there's too many builders trying to take the position of they can they can identify a risk and they can manage it. Whether that's say asbestos, we'll use asbestos, or whether it's um, latent conditions or the like. The reality is it just creates an opportunity for someone to apply some interpretation. And generally speaking, um, I, I, my view is that builders are overly optimistic and they're going to back themselves nine times out of ten to do something much better than perhaps what it, what it could turn out to be. And um, perhaps the right management hasn't been applied or the right conversations haven't been had at the start of the project to understand what, this, what the potential um, risk or the ramifications of that risk are I've had plenty of conversations with my staff recently about, well, you know, we're having an issue about whether we're going into new procurement, ask a hedge contractor to take a particular risk. One contractor's happy to take it limited to a, a certain amount and the other one's happy to take an unlimited risk on, on a component. And um, I'm not, not sure that there's enough recognition that when things go horribly wrong and, and we saw it, um, the Sydney, um, Sydney trams, down George Street, when things go horribly wrong, there's no contract provisions that are going to cover anything. So, you know, you're into court, whether or not the builders, you know, taken a position and they're clearly taking the risk, it's only going to generate different behaviours that are not going to be good for the project anyway. So I think there needs to be, 
there's no harm in having a more robust conversation about risk allocation. There's probably, you know, opportunity to have some very easy levels of further information or due diligence that goes into assessing those risks. So I do believe that, you know, that most risks can be categorised into who can manage that element better. But I also see that, you know, if, if we have some very simple things like some planning or some authority type issues, and there's an issue at the start of the contract or the procurement process about who carries that risk, and then the person that's most able to, to manage it by having conversations and actually diligently, you know, having the communications or the, uh, the, the, the meetings with the authorities is not doing it, they leave it too late, and then it just blows up into... Um, a mess because it just hasn't been adequately managed. And I, I keep on coming back to people. I think people and, and awareness and just having some uh, recognition or, you know, address it, all these things, this, we're, we're confronted with so many issues that have come from so many different angles through development and construction. And unless you've got really well, very capable people on the ground that are aware and got the right team around them, Think you know you can have the best risk mitigation profile that you want, but stuff gets missed all the time and stuff blows up and it gets nasty. Um, and we just need to confront that. You know, better due diligence, better reporting, and better oversight is probably the, the way we could deal with a lot of it. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Look, I did get the thumbs up because we're heading into a break that I could just we just extend for a minute or two, but we've come to the end of that. I just want a little bit of a farewell question. Uh, to both of you and a, a nice succinct answer and then I've got one more supplementary so we've got to be fairly quick I'm not standing between a virtual cafe and uh, <laughs> and uh, and and uh, the panel and the guests. At least it's not a virtual beer. So, yeah. That's it well virtual beers are after Murray so um, okay. really important. Um, I guess magic wand just one quick thing you'd like to change about um, the industry for innovation just one succinct point what, what would that be and perhaps go to you first Murray. Um, I, I think I think what I'd like to see is the is the mandatory use of BIM in in all projects above a certain level, which is certainly what they've done in Singapore and they've done in elements of the industry in uh, in the UK. I, it, it's just still so mixed and varied and inconsistent here, and I just think it would it would enable the supply chain to invest. Uh, you know, more confidently and, and also like from, from the t whatever tier right through the supply chain to invest and you can really start to get some traction and get the benefit out of it. I'm hoping Chris is not going to disagree because it's nearly a great way to finish. So, <laughs> Chris, I, I don't topic. necessarily agree with that, but I'll move on. <laughs> what about another um, one? <laughs> pa passion, I want passion and curiosity. That's, curiosity. You know, that's where I want the guy, the plasterer, when he's doing his job to make sure that he does the best job possible. And if there's an opportunity to, to observe a situation and raise a question or dive into it deeper to generate better outcomes or ask, you know, how do I improve on this? That's back to people and using their brains is where I'd like to be. Thanks, Chris. That's a great way to finish. There is one little supplementary question. Um, I don't know if we're going to get the interpretation for our Japanese delegates for this, but uh, Collingwood, Geelong this week, uh, both pretty passionate uh, PI supporters. Uh, any chance you can go all the way is, uh, and to do that, you've got to get over Geelong. Just a quick prediction. I'm um, going Collingwood by how much would uh, would be Murray? Collingwood by 10 points. Yes, Chris. Three goals. Well done, mate. Thanks very much. I'm sure we were in a lovely auditorium. We all have our hands together, but to both Chris and Murray, thanks for a, a great session and really appreciate your involvement. And thanks for the uh, making yourself so accessible as clients as well. You, you're terrific in their industry. Thank you. Back to you Cheers. Simon. Thanks, guys. Well done, Russell. Really appreciate thanks. it. See you, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much, Russell, Chris and Murray. And, uh, yeah, I think it's interesting that both Murray and Chris echoed that same point about the power of curiosity um, in terms of how do we respond to risk and uncertainty. I think curiosity is a beautiful framing of the approach that we should take. Uh, though I'm a little bit concerned, I don't know about anyone else, did it look like that uh, that um, Murray was joining us from a nuclear bunker underneath the streets of Sydney? And if he is, I'm kind of wanting to know what Murray knows that we haven't been told yet. <laughs>